Hi, today we're going to present the E2 calculus applications. In the financial markets, in addition to certain determinable trends, apparently random behaviors often occur. And that is why one way to understand the market is, as a stochastic system, we can say that it's a system whose future state, state or situation is uncertain, since it is determined not only by predictable elements, but also by elements of randomness. But it is clear that due to the uncertain nature of the market, there is always a risk factor or uncertainty. Regarding the future, it affects all investors who participate in it. Modeling these operations with the stochastic processes reduces the risk of losing money and having a bad outcome. In this project, we will be presenting a study of ETO processes and the Euler-Murayama method, which is the method to approximate a numerical so solution of a stochastic differential equation. It is an extension of the Euler method for ordinary differential equations to stochastic differential equations. Then we will be explaining how to solve stochastic differential equations with ETO's rule. After that, we will be simulating different trajectories for the following ETO processes. Geometric Brownian motion, Hulenbeck model, Basisek model, and the Cox inclination ross model, all four with fixed parameters, and comparing them with the ones obtained by the least squares and maximum likelihood estimation methods. Finally, we will, we will generate trajectories with parameters obtained from the values of the three months USA Treasury bonds and Coca-Cola's stock for a given year, and compare those trajectories with the real values in the year that follow. Now we're gonna explain what is an ETO process and a stochastic differential equation. So an ETO process is a common example of a stochastic differential equation given this form with an initial condition. And here, the first part is the derivative part, which is constant, and the second part, which is the random part. So a stochastic differ differential equation describe the instantaneous changes in stochastic processes. So these are some examples, the geometric Brownian motion, the orstein julebeck model, the Vasicek model, and the cox ingersoll ross model. To solve these differential equations, we're gonna use the Euler Maruyama method. This method, this method let us obtain a solution of a stochastic differential equation that has the particular structure of an ETO process given the initial condition, the in initial condition. This formula was in the past slide. So to do this, we divide the time interval in almost instantaneous little steps we turn dt to delta t. And we can also interpret dxt as an increment between two x processes. And due to the properties of the winner process, it is possible to interpret dwt as a normal random variable, zero dt. So here's a formula where x equals the initial value, delta t is the size of the step interval, and an s, no, an epsilon, sorry, is a random number variable with zero mean and standard deviation of one. Using this formula, it is possible to simulate different trajectories of a given process. So we now present the stochastic differential e equation of each of the process we are interested in and their particular recursive solution. So here's the solution of the geometric Brownian motion, which is down here, the solution of the orstein ulebeck model, the solution of the Vasicek model, and the solution of the cox ingersoll ross model. Now we have already seen how the 
stochastic differential equations for some of the EDOS process models look like. Now we're going to see how to actually work with them or solve them, so to speak. This is via the use of EDOS rule for second order processes. For that, we have to take a stochastic differential equation, such as the ones shown in the upper left, which is the uh, more general form. And we expand it in a similar manner to a Taylor series expansion. And we take it up to the third term, which is the second derivative, hence second order process. As we know, uh, a stochastic process function has two variables, which is time and the random variable x for that time. So if we take the, the Taylor series expansion, uh, we have the first differentiation or derivative in regards to time, the first derivative in regards to x, and the second order derivative in regards to x too. And for simplification, that's where we're gonna stop. We do algebra, calculus, or whatever it is that we have to do, depending on what f is. And we're, we're gonna see this more clearly with an example. Let's take, for example, the stochastic differential, differential equation for geometric brown in motion in the lower left, which has already been presented in previous slides. And let's say that the process generator function f is the natural logarithm of a random variable s t. Sorry for that. So we apply Ito's rule to this function. Uh, as we know, the first order derivative for the natural logarithm is just one divided by x, or in this case, st. And similarly for the second order derivative, it's just minus one divided by st squared, which is what we can see on, on the left side image. So since our derivative in regards to time is zero, that's why we don't have a first term. Then we have our first derivative in regards to st and our second order derivative in regards to st. Now, because of Ito's isometry rules, we know that the second order derivative dst squared can be replaced by dt. And we're just left with the rest of the terms that we're inside this term, so to speak, which are st squared and sigma squared. Now we group together in terms of one divided by st, which we can also see in the lower half of the left side image. And finally, we, let's remember that we have a, a, logarithm, a natural logarithm for our function. which is shown in the second image in the right, the middle one. And so to, well, we get to this, this form by taking the differenti differential of the function, which would be log st minus log s0. We add log s0 to both sides of the equation. And finally, uh, we just have to get rid of the natural logarithm, which is by applying the exponential function to both sides of the equation. And finally, we're left with the explicit form of st, which is s0 times e to the power of sigma bt plus t times mu minus sigma squared divided by two, which as uh, some of you may know, is the explicit function of the log normal distribution. So we can conclude that ST is distributed via a log normal function. Distribution, sorry. Okay, so now using the recursive solution that we previously presented, now we proceed to simulate a hundred trajectories for each of the process. To do this, we simulate, sorry, we code each of the solutions in Python. So let's take a look at the code. So here we are. So, okay, let's take, for instance, this um, process. 
And what we basically did is that we uh, define a function that calculates uh, one trajectory. And we have a loop right here. And what we do is for a vector called x, we calculate each of the values of the trajectory and we save it in the vector. And right here, we just define a matrix, the M matrix, that will save um, any number of trajectories we want. In this case, it will be 100, just right here. And yeah, okay, so. Let's see what we can get once we, once we run this code. So yeah, here we have the trajectories. And this same idea, um, we use the same idea to, um, to code and to simulate the rest of the process. So let's go back to our slides. And here we are. So uh, in the first case, we simulate uh, trajectories considering these particular values of the parameters. And it is important to notice that for each of the process, the mean of the trajectories is plotted as well. It is a red line. So let's check. So here we have uh, our trajectories for each of the process. Um, considering the parameters that we have uh, present before. And yeah, these are the trajectories. Um, the same idea applies for the case of the least square values of the parameters, which which is the average number, sorry, which is the average value of the estimator after 10,000 simulations. So yeah, these values were obtained by simulating 10,000 times uh, trajectories. So let's see what we can get uh, using these parameters. And yes, here we have the trajectories using those particular parameters. And for the case of the maximum likelihood method, um, we follow just the same idea. These values were obtained after simulating 10,000 10, times um, uh, the, the main trajectories. And here we have how these trajectories look for each of the process with these particular values of the parameters. And okay, let's let's take for instance this process and let's check what happens when when we compare each of the values of the parameters. And it is it is not difficult to see that even though we are using different values of the parameters, the trajectories look pretty, pretty the same. They don't change too much. So we can conclude that um, the methods to estimate the value of the parameters uh, do a great job in estimating the real values of the parameters. Comparison of average function and mean of trajectories. Now, we again present some trajectories for each process, but considering its particular average of expectation function, which are described as follows. These are the formulas we use. The average function will be the line in, color, in blue color, and these are the, the formulas. And the mean trajectory estimated will be in color red. And this is its formula. In all of the cases, the blue line describes the average function, as we already said. We also include the mean of the trajectory in the plot. 
is the right line in order to compare them. Now, let's see what we get. As we can see, these are the results. It's not difficult to see that for all the cases, both lines are, look pretty similar. Because the mean of the trajectories depends on how many trajectories we, sim we simulate. We can easily notice that the more trajectories we have, the more precise the mean of the trajectories become. This intuition is described as follows. This is the, an example of 10 trajectories. As we can see, the M is the number of trajectories we are going to use. So we can see that in, the, in taking 10 trajectories, the red line and the blue line are pretty different and are not even close uh, in the same line. They have a long distance between them. As we can see in the second graph, is 30 trajectories. Our M equals 30. So we can see that the red and the blue line are closer. Finally, the, we get the trajectory of one, 100 trajectories. So we can see that the, the blue line and the red line are closer. Once we presented the formulas to compute the theoretical average function and the formula to compute the estimator of the mean of the trajectories, now let's take a look at the code we used to calculate them. So let's switch to the Python and here we are. So let's take for instance this particular process and for the case of the um, estimator of the mean of the trajectories, what we basically did is that uh, for each of the times, we calculated the mean of the trajectory in that particular time, and we saved that value in a vector. For the case of the theoretical, theoretical average function, what we did is that we, um, we set uh, the particular values or parameters that each of this theoretical average function has. And we just simply um, apply these particular formulas to each of the time of the times in, in a given process. And we just save um, those values in a vector. So if we run if we run this code, sorry, this code, and we will we will be able to see um, both of the means. The red one as the um, estimator of the mean of the trajectories, and the blue one as the theor theoretical average function. So. We can conclude that the more trajectories we simulate, the more precise the estimator of the mean of the trajectories become, and the more it fits the theoretical average function. Now to wrap up all that we've seen so far, let's see a practical application. For example, we will try to predict the trajectory of the three month treasury bills of the United States. To do this, we use the Bastichek model and the Cox single soul Ross model because they adjust better to, to rates such as this one. To generate our trajectories, we use the information for the entirety of the year 2005. And then we compared it to the trajectory that actually happened in the year 2006, which is represented by the black line. The black line represents the real trajectory of the treasury bonds in the year 2006. And as we can see, it's not too far off from the midi, from the mean, sorry. And it's well within the, the bulk of the trajectories. So the model was pretty solid in this regard. And we did a similar analysis with the value of Coca-Cola stocks. We fed the model with 
the values from 2005 and 2006, and we applied it to the real trajectory of the year 2007. So once again, the black line represents the trajectory of the Coca-Cola stocks in 2007, the real trajectory. And uh, again, uh, we applied the ornstein Ollenbeck model. Once again, we see that the prediction is pretty solid. Uh, the black line is not too far off from the mean, which is the red line. And once again, it, it is well within the, the intervals we estimated previously and within the bulk of the trajectories. Well, finally, once we have reproduced the results of the four ITO processes shown before, we can conclude that each process has its particular characteristics, each of them showing a different tendency through time. The simulations of these processes can be analyzed using some knowledge acquired before in this course and in others such as risk maths. One of the objectives of this project was to use apply the euler mariyama method in a stochastic processes, which states that, it's possible, that it is possible to find a solution for any given stochastic differential equation with an initial condition using a stochastic processes trajectories in a given time interval using a discretization method of the instantaneous change, changes in the processes. We use this method to have a more theoretical interpretation of each method so we could compare the observed statistics of each process with their theoretical approximation. One of the immediate results of this was the similarity presented between each process's mean functions and the calculated approximations. This means that whether you simulate the process or just know its parameters, you can determine the main tendencies, mean and standard deviation of these processes which can simplify the calculus and comprehension of these topics, as well as define safe tendencies more easily. When speculating about the future, an actuarian must have solid knowledge of probability and stochastic processes in particular, since understanding and to extend controlling the randomness of models that vary according to a family of random variables over time lets us make science-based predictions and not just wild guesses. It's impressive to see the capability of modeling that these processes show, mainly when we talk about modeling financial market tendencies such as the behavior of stocks or rates over time. The near instant change adjustments within the process show a great similarity with the life behavior. And even when it's not the only applications they have, it's possibly the most important application they have within the field of actuarial mathematics. Having an idea of where a given stock rate bond, etc., within an investing portfolio is going throughout the time is of great help, since it gives you a general idea of how much investments will yield on return, and said returns are vital for insurance companies who rely on them to pay their investors back and to pay the, face the losses derived from the insurance policy contracts celebrated with their clients. <laughs>